three plus. And, you know, so, so you still play games where everybody has to get a pass or all this, but it's not what you're, you're not focused on this team play stuff yet. You know, like as far as coaching and pushing, you know, those ideas. Yeah. And then there's some people that, that never become a team player. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> well, Jordan. Why, well, why I used to ask that question in uh, job interviews <laughs> that uh, before HR said I couldn't ask it anymore uh, and I had to use their script was uh, if, have you ever played team sports and if so what sports and when I was an administrator at a high school they always made the mistake of, uh, well, not always, but many of the candidates made the mistake thinking all I was looking for was people who would coach uh, team uh, teams at my school. But no, it was whether you could work with others or whether you've ever had to actually work with others to, towards a goal. Uh, and I get that as a, as a college coach from like the police departments or different businesses, you know, and they they're attracted to the players, you know, they, they get the same qualification educationally, but the fact that they've been on a team and had to work for people with other people and, you know, be, be part of a team is really important. And, and the funny part is there's two questions that I, I think that you could ask. One is uh, where you are in the birth order. And, and the other one is uh, if you've ever been a part of team sports, and that will tell you a lot as to whether they will collaborate with anyone. <laughs> Yeah. Rick. If you're out if you're out there, Rick, your mic is off. We're all guilty once in a while. Oh, maybe maybe he stepped away. Wayne Wayne, are you still there? Are you still there? Do you have any sort of closing thoughts? Yeah, no, I'm still here, uh, just listening in. Uh, just one thing I'd mentioned, uh, it just kind of reminded me of uh, when Tom mentioned uh, like the, the police department. Um, I remember the police department, actually, their recruiters coming, when I was coaching at my, uh, college hockey, uh, the recruiters actually came and asked the, the athletic department to set up a session just so they could speak to the athletes. Um, and it's for that exact re reason that you were mentioning about, you know, the ability to, to work with, uh, you know, with a team and work with others. In fact, the Calgary, I, I don't know if, the, the, if they're still doing this or not, but at that time, the Calgary Police Force actually had set up their, uh, um, you know, their, their different shifts as teams. So they had different groups that were working together and, and, um, you know, so yeah, it was uh, it was a, a team based approach, and they were actively recruiting um, athletes just because of that uh, that experience. Yeah, nice. Rick, Rick, are you still there? I hope he comes on because I'd sure like to hear what he got out of it. Uh, I I wanted to ask Daryl another question uh, related to the ethics piece and uh, shortening the bench versus managing the bench is what well he was shortening it typically for the victory and and uh, I think the Maple Leafs are managing the bench very well this year because the Oilers I'm not sure they figured it out and I wanted to ask him I, about the philosophy of the coaching there where all players are earn, earning roles and playing roles. And uh, I cut out a clip, Tim, and I think I sent it to you and a few others from the news of uh, Calgary Herald where the Toronto head coach was talking about not giving enough ice time to uh, Matthews. And he talked about having a comfortable lead and letting everybody play, but earning, you know, keeping everybody in the game. And, you know, the reality is they're managing the bench and they're getting more out of everybody. Minor hockey, they shorten the bench, kids quit. It's criminal. Like, he gets it. He he committed a criminal acts years ago. And he's realizing it now. You can't measure 
you know, my measurement of the of the impact of that, it's the Cicerello incident, and it's our damn society as a whole, not fig- not being able to communicate and figure things out well. So uh, I don't know. I, I'm going to play with bits and pieces of this. Um, I think I finished up the last one on Dave's. I don't know if everybody's had a chance to look at them. I was hoping Dave would join us. He knew I didn't call him to remind him. I just wanted to see if he would come on. And I, I think I'd be able to convince him to both get on. But <clears throat> Daryl's thinking is is really ahead of the curve. You know, I, I think I I just appreciate what he's doing. And I, I think we see the results by the way the team he's uh, working with so uh, I'll work at getting them both together and if if Daryl wants to get on again anytime he might be a guy who would be a fly on the wall and we of course would get him to you know I'll let him join in anytime if they have a Thursday morning off I'm sure he'll join in but uh, it was really a Things happen for a reason, a fluke that Dave got on and a fluke that Daryl got on. So I'm I'm pretty happy with that and look forward to next week. I don't know how we'll be able to top this except uh, just have ideas of things you want to talk about given your, your worlds. I think that would be a good idea next week. And I'll uh, now that I've had Daryl on, my goal is to communicate with Dave. I'm going to promote his book a lot more than I have once he actually sends me the copy. Apparently, when it was printed, there was an error and it had to be reprinted, so they stopped the shipments. I got it on Kindle. Now, is that a written copy? Well, it's his book on, you know, it's an e-version of it. Electronic. Yeah, electronic. Well, apparently it was a spelling error. And I, I don't cover, there was a cover mistake on the cover. Yeah, you, on the cover. If you yeah. look at the it on Amazon, uh, it was missing a word in the title. Really well. Yeah. Easy uh, to easy to fix on the ebooks. Not so easy on the paper books. <laughs> That's a pretty expensive error. Yeah. Might so be worth uh, a lot in years to come, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Wally, one thing I might do is I might reach out to uh, Dan Bochner, who's that skill coach I mentioned that he works with all the Russian teams, all the female teams and the men's teams. Yeah. He's in Toronto as well. I was kind of surprised that Daryl didn't really know him. Um, I'm sure he knows of Daryl, and he might be willing to get on with us at at some point. And I, I think it was actually good that they both weren't on together. Um, it was good to have their own platform. Uh, yeah. But it would, would at some point be obviously great to have them on um, uh, together at some point. Uh, be It would be pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to give, Tim, I'm going to, uh, we're sort of, it's really difficult. We have such a cross-section here. I'm coming from the minor hockey, Al Ramsey, Al Andrews, Al, um, I don't know whether, you know, his, his minor hockey and Al's big in the ethics point of view. And he suggested a speaker for me that's written a book that she come and talk to us. It's called Lessons from Behind the Glass. Her name is Allison Tufts, a hockey mom. And it is a great book. But I, you know, when you don't know somebody, I, I wonder about her getting on, but I'm looking at the table of contents and she would completely deal with this ethical base that Daryl might want to get into and he might want to hear if she was to get on. So I might experiment with seeing if she would get on and getting Daryl on if possible at the same time, but uh I mean, I, I love the NHL. I love doing what we're doing and making the game better. But I like Daryl. I'm really still concerned about leaving the game in a better place. And I think that getting her on might be something I would do. But 
it's not something that we're you know emotionally invested in to the degree that we are the game and with the so NHL, you're missing part, partly that i mean that's terrific wally we're all i think we're all with you on that and um two things number one um if if you manage to touch base with her and if she was willing to come on maybe give us all a month's head start so we can actually get her get her book and read some of it uh, that would be number one yeah. and the, the the value i would see like i don't want to have dan come on just because he's another skill guy but daryl's a skill guy and we got a hell of a lot out of both sides of the equation yeah. the technical side and the ethical side from uh, a marquee coach like Daryl, Dan is sort of in that same category. Yeah. And if he's saying the same thing, it just gives you yeah. another vehicle to uh, yeah. transport your ethical uh, coaching um, mantra on. Yeah. So like, it, it's all good. I think we all enjoy everything. And, um, and Morris would be quick to point out, you shouldn't use the word, but when you're <laughs> making <those> statements. <laughs> Now, I tell you, with Daryl, I think we've got an end to people that are in the in, on front pages um, doing what we're doing. Like getting one of the players he's worked with would for this group and talking about his work and being a part of it with Daryl on is a possibility. And I don't know what... Even Daryl's influence with other coaches, whether it's a coaching staff or a skills coach, talk about that type of thing. But there's all kinds of new opportunities that come in. Um, I will mention to Alan to get a hold of this lady. And uh, you you might want to write down the name of the book. And if it's available, I've I've never bought it. I'm going to buy one. Well, I would buy hers on Kindle, I think, behind the glass. If you guys wanted to write it down, just in case. And it's Allison, A-L-L-Y-S-O-N, T-U-T-F-T-S. The Journey of a Hockey Mom. And the languaging and everything she's doing, I think, is something that uh, we would identify with. So, I uh, it has it's lessons from behind the glass, and I'm just looking at the the lessons here, the contents, and it's there's some of them that are are pretty good. I I wouldn't mind hearing her speak. One can you, of them, read, can you uh, read those titles? Uh, sure. uh, lesson one is don't force your passion; your child will find their own. Two is leave your baggage at home. Three, is parents see hockey through a different set of eyes. Uh, four, before you yell at your child for their performance on the ice, take a good look at your conduct in the stands. Uh, five is raise a good person who loves to play hockey, not just a good hockey player. Uh, six is nothing in hockey is free, but it's the cost that teaches you the most. Uh, seven is enjoy the ride. The game will be over before you know it. Uh, eight is play through the politics. Nine is your dreams shouldn't cost you your integrity. And 10 is let go of the control. You never had it in the first place. So I'm going to forward that uh, title of that book to Daryl and just have him read the table of contents because talk about something that would, would uh, you know, resonate with what he said. He's sincere about what he said, given his minor hockey experience. And um, I'm really curious of the influence on Toronto and whether they're managing the bench, shortening it, managing it, not shortening it, which is what teams get caught up with. And boy, when you have superstars, I'm I'm really amazed because I don't know that it's the best. The best players don't win. The best team wins. They, I, in my my quick observation would be, he shortens the bench. He doesn't manage it. He plays he plays those top guys a ton. Yeah, and uh, that's not to say he doesn't try to manage the bottom as best he can. But my quick observation from all I've seen is, he, he's a he's a pro coach. He he's trying to win, and he 
he plays his top players a ton and probably more than more than he should. And just a note on Allison, she's a professor of social work at uh, Loyalist College in Belleville, Ontario. Okay. So for you, Tim, this is a question for another day, likely, but I think yourself and uh, TJ and and others that play positional play in the NHL, because um, I know uh, talking with Clint, it doesn't it, it didn't impact him that much. But we had I had a quick conversation with him about it with the way that the game changed with television and television timeouts, and you look at the use of of your players that you can use uh, those top players more the problem is you don't use your bottom players enough to keep them engaged because any of us that played in the in old school coaching that that uh, you didn't play as a rookie or whatever you know what happened when your legs were cold <laughs> you were going out there and played like crap but uh with Clint, when I was talking with him, it was about in the IHL when he was coaching there and, and guys I know that played there when they had such a short bench and everybody had to play. And it made it better, uh, they found, because uh, it made it easier for everyone to be engaged in it. But it's kind of the question I guess I'd have for guys like yourself is, do you think that it would have changed the game when you guys were playing in the era that you played in uh, with having the the guaranteed, you know exactly when those TV timeouts are going to be uh, by just looking at the clock, you know when the next one's coming up and the number of them per period, whether that would have would have changed it even back then, thinking about guys like Gretzky and, and those guys on the ice. I, I think a quick answer would be, I, I think un, unquestionably it would have, um, although, you know, coaching period was nothing like it is now nothing uh wally used the phrase an hour or two ago you know back in the day um there was a you were referencing um video i think and the coaches just told it back in the day we didn't freaking have video i didn't have it when i was in the nhl nobody ever showed video when i was my whole career my whole career it just wasn't a thing until roger nielsen really um I mean, he started it in the mid '70s, but it didn't become a thing. But I think, unquestionably, it would have. And I think the other thing that plays into that NHL dynamic is that allows the coaches to play the top players more. But players, generally speaking, even though Daryl said they their goals are all over the map, generally speaking, they want to play and be in the lineup. Number one. Number two, they want to win because if they're part of a winning lineup, they get to stay in the game longer. So wanting to win and being heavily motivated to win is more of a, an incentive at that level, I think, than, um, than a lot of people realize. So players will put up with more, you know. But there's a point, and, and I think Tippy probably crosses that point in Edmonton where like Wally says, they're not enough of a team. They maybe can't get as much out of themselves because they play too much. Those two players. And he's close to that in Toronto too. Um, they play, they play those top two lines a ton irrespective of TV timeouts, but just watching them play Tim, uh, Belfry, uh, and I'm not sure what their culture is in terms of bench management, but I'm watching Matthews and uh, those players, the good, the star players are playing better without the puck than the Oilers star players. And uh, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's all I can go on. You know, I don't know the minutes. All I know is the minutes in the NHL are managed better than the minutes in minor hockey. In other words, they, they're they trying to win, and that's how you win, by managing the bench well with what you have to deal with. Big salaries, egos, you name it. Minor hockey, you don't have that. But separating the business from the sport of hockey, that's why that lady's article, a book, should be important, and 
Uh, I don't want to lose track of that, and I'm glad Alan suggested it, and I'm glad I got to bring it up because uh, it filters up to the top where they get it right. It, there, it's a science of managing the bench to, to get the most out of you, all your players that they feel they have a role, and Daryl mentioned that. They want a role. I asked that leading question, Tim, and you said the answer I wanted, which they want to play. They want to have fun. They want to play. And, and really, once the game's over, I think they still have as much fun as we did. And uh, so the essence of why they play, they make big money, but the essence of why you play for a living, boy, that's, that's really a... Uh, it's it's fun. It's a simple, you know, it's a simple reverse effect. And sometimes I think we just got to get this message across in minor hockey so that as it goes up the ladder, it doesn't mean you shorten the bench. You just manage it like you got to manage it as you go up the ladder and manage it to the degree that you are comfortable with at the level you got. So I really liked him saying, that he's embarrassed with what he did. I think we probably all are, aren't we? <laughs> I know I am. Well, I, uh, yeah. I did, I did it in football, and I brought this story up where my first year coaching. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we've all I, been. I wouldn't do it again. Uh, and I think, it, you, you know, you have your culture, you have your philosophy. And I think, you know, when I ask them the question, who's responsible, I'm, of course, referring to sports governing bodies and, and educating coaches, which is what they're responsible for going up the ladder. I go back to what I was taught by an HR person, and I don't like to listen to them very often. Uh, <laughs> but the one time they were telling me about culpability, and they said, if they didn't know any better, they are not culpable. You are as their supervisor. And so then they said that, that uh, your role as a supervisor is to make them culpable, that they know better. <laughs> and if, then if they make the mistake, then we have recourse. And uh, so that's, that's the same with this, Wally. When we made mistakes, I think about it as a as a, a student teacher or a coach, the, when I made those, the mistakes that I see as mistakes um, were, some of them were one, well, I'm hoping that all of them were ones was I just didn't know better. Now that I know better, if I did the same thing again, then as uh, Daryl said, then I'd be uh, fully responsible. So. No, no I, as long as we don't lose sight of that, uh, We'll see who else Daryl can get on down the road. And, and uh, I, I asked Kinger a year ago to join us, and he was doing those NHL casts. He's probably doing two or three podcasts a week He's trying right to now. write a book, too. Yeah. Um, I might read his book on Kindle <laughs> sooner than later. But Tim, I sent you uh, a picture of Duthie's book. And one of the most easiest, funniest, story of reads i've ever seen um it's titled beauties and uh it's just the reason guys played is in those stories the the antics the goings on the scrapping the very funny and there's stories of a few of the women cami granado and Haley are referred to in there telling their stories Poulan talks about in that book a, a chapter about about the uh, Wickenheiser and and her influence uh, Tessa von Maham as well. So uh, Daryl's book, if I don't know, Tim, have you read the every three or four chapters? One of the players he works with writes about what they get out of it. And it's that's amazing. There, there are, you know, there are testimonials of the work he does and the way they perceive them, and 
how they appreciated it. And if your players are writing about him like that, the best players, um, he's making them better without interfering with the coach. That to me, you know how I'm always suspicious of the skills experts that come out. They do the work. I'm even afraid of assistant coaches sometimes not being on the same page and you know being all one. But uh, the the role of the coach being supported, the head coach being supported, is huge. That that's one of the things I'd love to hear him talk about. Is uh, you know I I I wanted to ask him uh, as we talked about before. I wanted to ask him does he do anything on the defensive side at all? Does he talk to any of his clients on the defensive side? But more importantly, because uh, as you as you suggested. You know, he, he certainly has an impact on the on the Leafs and the teams they work with. Yeah. But how much, if at all, does he have to push, pull, and cajole and convince the head coaches that this piece that he wants to add is a good thing or a bad thing? How much are they on the same page? How much are they not on the same page? And how much work does it take for them to sort of get together on things that would be interesting to hear him talk about that too well dave dave king talked a little bit about it's not his work is to make them better offensively when they retrieve the puck how they're going to get it when they get it what they're going to do with it joining the attacks kind of thing i don't think they focus on what dave used to focus on was how do you play the rush you know, all play without the puck. And I was the guy who looked at tactical skating. So I don't think Daryl would he, you know, I like the way the defensemen are playing. But last night, I think I shared a short three-second clip of that linear crossover and the D crossing over with them and wiping out. It's just a simple exercise no that's not mcdavid you should be able to stride and play that gap or set that gap better i don't know i'm not there i'm just saying when they cross their feet like that and uh, i looked at alan texts me every time a goal is scored and a defenseman's crossed his feet and uh, pretty much of any direct attack of a goal scored that's occurred at some point though no, that's not the total reason of course but I'm just saying that's pretty fundamental. And uh, don't overlook it. But I love the offensive game. It's fun to watch. Really fun. I enjoyed last night's game. Did you watch the whole thing, Kim? I only only watched two periods before I had to switch off and watch something Barb wanted to watch. Yeah. I, can, I can always, uh, so don't tell me the final result, but I can always watch the third period maybe today. But. Um, I still, it would be really interesting to know because like that whole hockey sense piece is so important and different coaches have different concepts of how you play the game offensively. And that's what I mean. Like the Leafs obviously are very skilled, but that doesn't mean that everything that Daryl thinks they, they should do or wants to do with the players, Sheldon Keith thinks is great. There's going to be some differences and I would love to get some insight into, you know, what does he think about that um, and and how how that piece happens? Uh, how do they get on the same page? Yeah, I had written that down to be more specific with questions on them. I, I one thing I wanted to bring up and when Jordan came on and I we went on another tangent, it was Dominic Pittis, and it was about parents. and Dominic. He's, he's bought into the figure-it-out concept with his three words. Does anybody pressure, possession, and play? That's a pretty general, simple, simple system. And But when he went away on a trip, having coached that way, and they played that well, they played. And I, I put play in quotation marks. Watching the whole Montreal game last night, I think Toronto, in quotation marks, outplayed them. Toronto might have outworked them, but they, they just seem to be playing a more fluent, 
possession kind of game. So Dominic's statement, ask the parents, to me is bridging the ethical gap and the technical gap because if you don't have their support, you're done. And that that's that's my point in the future is coaches coming up the ladder, being able to talk to parents, but who can talk to them as confidently as Dominic, I don't know. But just acknowledging them as people at least and being able to explain what you're doing might be a, a way of bridging that trust gap. And the word trust is huge with Daryl and the group he's working with. So, All Jay, right. I'm going to hop off here, guys. It's been a good morning and not a very pressure-packed one for me as uh, there's <laughs> myself and the head building operator here. But, okay. Uh, as long as my vehicle starts to go home later, it's <laughs> that'll be the most you important. Plug it in. Is it plugged in? Oh no, but it's uh, oh. it should be oh. fine. It it ran to get here, and it did say minus forty at a couple of spots on the road, but still says minus thirty on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think you'll be going out to the ODR. If you were a child, you would be. If hey. Here's a here's an interesting weather stat for you. Barb found the other day. She said, I think it was like Friday or Saturday. I think it's the first time in history that every part of Canada has been below zero. Like um, Victoria only has like 28 days in the last hundred years or something that are under zero for the high. And on one day last week, the whole country was below zero. Mm. Yikes. No, well, that is interesting. And then and then on the weather network it's saying about how the how uh, the the planet is losing its ice at an alarming rate. So Yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks guys. See you this later. Is, good to see you, Jordan. Uh, yeah. this has been great. Wally, Tom, yeah. Rick, whoever still left on, great. but uh, we'll do it again next week. It was totally awesome. Thanks for getting them on, Wally. Oh, I'm glad he did. Yeah, hey, I see great. Rick's face. Rick. I, I've, I've texted him and everything else. Uh, I haven't yet. He might be, might have stepped away. Okay. So, anyway, uh, see you next week, guys. Okay, guys. Yeah, really take good. care. Yeah, I got to see you. Yeah. I'm going to the kitchen, so take care. Tom, have a good day. Wayne, are you still on? Yeah, take, take care, Wally. How were you able to stay on the whole time this time? No work or? Yeah, I was, uh, no uh, no uh, other meetings or, or calls or anything. So uh, yeah, it worked out good. I'm, I'm curious about a guy like Brad. I was hoping for, you know, that a few coaches would have been on like major junior coaches, but I'm wondering how they got, what they got out of it. <coughs> Yeah, Brad was, uh, he listened in for uh, a little bit of the, the call this morning, but then uh, I think his, one of his uh, boys had a nice time or something or a training yeah. session. So he had to step away, but he'll, uh, when you send out the recordings, um, you know, he'll, he'll definitely watch and, and listen to that. And yeah. I told him I'd uh, fill him in on some of the things that I, uh, you know, was able to pull out of the, uh, out of the discussion as well. Well, I'm going to stop recording now, and uh, I'll send.